name is Rose Chiachi, and I'm the Executive Director of the Pike County Public Library. I'm here to today to tell you how to sign up for a library card. If you're a Pike County resident, it's really easy. You just stop by with proof of residency and a photo ID, and we'll get you all signed up. If you're not a resident, it's also really easy. You can just stop by with a photo ID, and for $35, you'll have full access to all of the library resources. Unfortunately, right now, our buildings aren't open to the public, but you can still sign up for a library card on our website, www.pcpl.org. Whether you're doing research for a project or looking for some inspiration, we can absolutely help you find what you're looking for. A really cool thing about libraries is that if we don't have the item that you're looking for, we can find it for you, no problem. We have a huge network of libraries in Pennsylvania and the entire country that we can borrow from on your behalf. Please check out our website, www.pcpl.org, for all of the virtual opportunities we're offering right now, or give us a call with any questions. Finally, I want to thank everyone from Peters Valley for bringing these great programs to our community and including the library. Thank you, and I hope you enjoy the program. Good evening, everyone. I'm so glad to see you all here this evening. I'm Kristen Muller, Director of Peters Valley School of Craft, and I want to thank Rose and the Pike County Library for co-hosting these lectures with us. And I want to thank uh, the Pike County, um, Greater Pike County Community Foundation through the Richard L. Snyder Fund for funding these lectures, these artist lectures that we've been doing for a number of years now. And for over a year, we've been doing them virtually. So, um, so thank you everyone for tuning in and for funding our, our event. Um, if you haven't come to Peters Valley, our campus is open to the public. We are now um, running workshops and enrolling people and it's gonna be a wonderful, safe summer. Tonight, we welcome Leslie Grossman. And Leslie has taught for Peters Valley for a very long time. And I have been really, really fortunate to take my first mono printing class with her and uh, I learned so much. So Leslie, um, she was born and raised in Midwest America. She received her prim inking BFA from Western Michigan University in 2008 and her Master's of Fine Arts in Printmaking from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville in 2012. Since two, 2005, Leslie's been a curator and director of various galleries. She has exhibited her work nationally and internationally and her prints and books can be found in multiple university and private collections. Currently, Leslie lives and makes art in Philadelphia and Lansdowne, PA, where she is a, the administrative coordinator of Crane Arts and curator of the Crane Arts Tenant Gallery. Her book and paper peddling name is Parhelion Works, and she has two cats who are slowly making her crazy. So tonight, we have this special treat in Leslie's new studio, right? Welcome, Leslie. Um, while Leslie's tuning in and turning on her screen, I want to let you all know that we have um, at the bottom of the page, we have a Q&A space. So if you have questions for Leslie, please pop them in there. And when we're done with the presentation, I'll ask her the questions and she'll get a chance to answer. And in the chat, uh, Rachel will put um, her website and information so you can look up uh, Leslie's work and her site. So welcome, Leslie. Hello. <laughs> uh, hi, everybody. I'm Leslie Grossman, and I'm about to show you a boatload of books. Um, so first of all, um, people might want to know my books. You must love to read. And I'm actually going to make a very public confession right now, one that I've kind of been a little bit embarrassed about uh, forever, um, is that I'm not a big reader. Um, I never really was as a child, uh, and I, I just couldn't really, I didn't have the attention for it. Um, I just never really, um, I was a slow reader. Uh, so, um, but it was something about the form of a book that was just really exciting to me. It's like, it's like this little package, it's this little gift, um, and you can open it up and it has all these layers to it and there are discoveries along the way. And when you're done with it, you just take it with you. Um, so I love the fact that there's like this object. Um, so, you know, for instance, uh, well, actually I'm gonna start off with these um, images. Uh, I grew up with 
my parents and my sister all being big into theater. Um, and we had very imaginative play, very DIY play. Um, this is a scroll uh, from Butcher's block paper of the frog prints that we made and then did this like windowed cardboard box that we would run the panels through. So um, that's the kind of play that we had when I was a kid. Um, but I would get really excited when in school we would have these books that would be professionally bound of our, of our poems that we would make. Um, so I was, I loved these things. I coveted them and I still do. Um, so, so I liked them as these packages. Um, so when we think about books, I want everybody to close their eyes, like right now, like seriously, like close your eyes. I know there's one person that's not closing their eyes and please do it right now. Think of a book. Just imagine a book in your mind. I'm not going to give you any other prompt. Keep your eyes closed. All right, open them. That's not a book, is it? Is that what you were looking at in your mind? Yeah, it is. It's got a cover. It's got a beginning and an end. It's got a story. It's linear. There's a type of binding involved. This is actually a style called scroll and it is um, it precedes the codex book um, so you know books can be more than what you think they are but a lot of you maybe thought about these kind of books hardback books they have a cover they have contents pages they have text or they have images in that content. Um, they have a binding, um, they have a spine. They typically have this beginning and end to them, um, which brings up that, that notion of linearity in time. Um, but other attributes to books are their documentation. They're storytellers. Um, they are used in rituals and religions, um, dissemination of information like, like zines. Um, this is a full page zine, but stapled at the top. This is to disseminate some poetry and um, stories. They can be used as whoops, reference. Or guides. Or catalogs. or instructional. And this is probably all backwards for y'all. Sorry about that. This is actually a really great book by Esther K. Smith called How to Make Books. Um, she's an artist who you would love to look up great. Well, not right now, but. Um, so I'm gonna actually go through, I have about 50 books here. So I'm gonna point my camera down. Um, but before I do, I just want to explain the artist books. It's what I'm going to be showing you. Um, they're not really books about art, um, but they are art expressed in book form. Um, so when the content and the form, like the shape of the book, they're created together and given this like equal significance, um, the book then becomes this like, like, you know, more than just like this simple container for information, it becomes an object, an art object. Um, but the goal of many artists' books is to involve the reader um, actively in the viewing process. And that's not only to see the words or the images on the page, but they also help you think about how the words, the pictures, the physical form of the object, how they all work collaboratively to deliver a message or a feeling or an emotion. Um, and this can be achieved by changing that traditional codex form into a scroll or an accordion um, by altering, say, you know, the typography or by using some kind of creative binding um, so that the work draws attention to itself as a whole. Um, 
Some books go further though, um, altering the form to this point that the book no longer really functions as like for reading. Um, it becomes so altered that it's purely sculptural. Um, and the bindings can be torn up uh, or sculpted or tied and text may be written in unconventional materials or, um, or completely unintelligible. Um, and that means that all that's left uh, is the idea that the book and the viewer's reaction to it is that moment. And I really love that. Um, so I'm just gonna go over, well, I'm gonna show you a whole bu bunch of different binding techniques. Um, and there'll be some that are a little bit more traditional that you'll maybe be more familiar with and some that will just blow your socks off. All right. So, oh, let's give a good angle there. I'll lose my power. Let's see how she goes there. Uh, all right. So, first of all, books can come as simple as, they can be made as simple as a single sheet. These are called octavo books and they're typically, I'll show this one first. It's got a little cover on it. And they're typically these books that can be read page by page. But what's really cool about them is that they are one single sheet, double-sided. So when they play together nicely, they fold up like a nice little book that you can read in linear time. Same with this one too. There's a linear quality to it if you flip page by page or it can be opened up into one sculptural or one single sheet. A lot of these are used for like kind of pamphlet style. Um, a lot of propagandistic um, works are on octavo books. Um, dissemination is um, key when uh, with these books. Here's another one here. This is by Melissa Havland, I believe. Another single sheet form is the accordion. A lot of folks are very familiar with the accordion. They can be one single sheet uh, or they can be multiple with just a little bit of glue to hold those multiple sheets together. And they can be as long as you can make them. Now this one does take some glue because I have the, case, uh, the covers on them, but without the cover, um, that. Here's another accordion. This is one that I made for a one a day project. I made this in one night. These are very quick, quick books to make. This was a part of a portfolio exchange that uh, for a class that I taught. And this is all screen print on the inside. Again, the accordion can be read one page at a time, or it can be read as a full story. And what I love about accordions is there is that thread that runs through, or each thread can be individually att paid attention to. So single sheet books, they usually take no glue, no sewing, no nothing. You can just take a sheet of paper and fold it up. But then there are books that are, I call them no sew books. And these are books that are fold and glue. So let's see. Here's a fold and glue. So this is a kind of a fancy looking book, right? 
It looks like a regular old hardback, but what this is called is a drum leaf. And there are two pages that are actually glued together. They're what it's called is tipped together um, at the tip. There it is. So there's no sewing involved. It's glued up here, glued there. And so it's kind of this like very billowy, poofy sculpture until it's glued into the cover. Let's see up here. Um, one thing that y'all might be familiar with with a paperback book is called a simple binding. And that is just simply gluing in single sheets into the spine. That's how all paperbacks are. So these are all individual single sheets, no folding, just gluing. These are little, I call them adornments. They sell at craft fairs. Here's another simple binding. That's a, let's see if I can get this here, a flip book. A little bit easier to see there. Flip books are great with simple binding. This is also, uh, this is kind of a style of an accordion book. It's a little bit more sculptural, but this is just strictly folding and gluing down onto the covers. This one's a little bit more of a sculptural style. And this is actually a drum leaf as well. It's just each page is a circle folded in such a way and glued to the back of the next page. But it's this very cool tactile piece that is just really fun to play with. This one's pretty fragile though. Um, another single sheet that I'm going to kind of lead into some no glue and only sewing books. Um, these are called post bound and these are also single sheets and there are these little posts that screw in. I'm sure that you've seen them on like maybe ledgers um, and these are all separate individual sheets. And uh, you can take the posts off, you can remove pages easily, you can put pages in. That's the benefit of a post bound book. Same with this guy. But I have this as like kind of this flip style. And then this one is also actually a post bound, but there's a different hardcover technique to it. So the cover actually covers the posts. So they're hidden away. And then the individual pages. And then the back is also hinged. So those are all no so um, unless you're gluing the cover paper or book cloth onto the book board. Um, then these are really just fold and glue. This one I have. I love pamphlet books. They are hands down for me the easiest sewing technique. And you see a lot of them. You'll see them a lot with staples, any kind of like brochure, a lot of artist catalogs, like for instance, the one I was showing earlier of John Hitch Hitchcock's. Um, it's just a staple here. This is a pamphlet style book. You see these everywhere. But they're also sewn. And all it takes is just poking some holes and a sewing pattern that's very simple and then you have your folded sheets. Each individual sheet that's folded is called a folio, and the whole thing together is called a signature. So these are single signature books. That can be seen easily. 
Um, I also like to put uh, pamphlet books right into hardcovers too. And sometimes it's really fun to add these just like little sneaky pages in here that um, little smaller pieces just to shake it up. Kind of a fold out piece. And there's also sets of pamphlet books that I really enjoy making sets of things. So this was a five book set with glued on pieces from um, a player piano roll. And I just loved these upside down messages on the sides. And so each one is just a blank book and it's almost like a like a memory books or keepsakes for someone. Um, with pamphlet books, you can also actually have multiple signatures and they can all be sewn in to doing long stitches on the side. So these are all individual pamphlets that are then sewn right into the binding. This is from Life Drawing, so you're gonna see some nudes here. Same with this one too. I got this one in Poland, this little baby pamphlet stitch book, multi-signature. Put little secrets in it. I have some secrets started. It's got a little nice wrap. I love these because you can just quick make them, throw them in your pocket, and go. It's another book. I make these for a drawing group that unfortunately we haven't met in a long time um, because of COVID. But um, these are, you know, this is like a book that I made in one night because I didn't have enough, you know, any pages left in my other book, uh, my other sketchbook. But um, but yeah, these are great because then I can, I'm not stuck with just the single signature because the more pages that you're folding over and over and over on themselves, the thicker it gets and the harder it is to sew and then it just pops open. So that's the benefit of having um, multi-signature books all cased in together. Pamphlet books, favorite, but sometimes you want, I don't know, two pamphlet books in one. And that's called a do -si do just like the square dance move when you spin your partner round and round. And these are amazing little books that are so fun. I like giving them away as, um, or making them as gifts for say, people who are getting married or, um, you know, couples gifts. Um, they're so fun. They are right reading in both directions. Um, so there's no turning upside down to read the other side. Um, I do a lot of paper marbling and you're gonna see that um, in a few books to come. Um, I really got into it uh, because I didn't have any papers, uh, nice papers for the end sheets. Um, and so I just started teaching myself how to make it. Another one. The screen print on the inside on top of the marbled paper. And I also have magnets in these too, so they kind of stay nice and closed. So pamphlets. There are other no glue books. Um, one is called a stab bound book. And it is the ancient binding of Japan and China. Um, and this kind of precedes the, the typical codex form. Um, it's generally um, very simple binding on the outside. Um, it is done so to make, to expose the binding because it's, and spine, because it's, you can make so many different patterns with it, but this is just a basic set, uh, standard 
pattern. I like to make these little windows in here and stamp things into them. Um, one thing that is tough about stab binding is that you really need to use thinner sheets of paper because they don't open flat. Um, they like to they like to close shut on you. And that's why I made this really long one instead. Um, so this is actually a pattern that I found online called a tornado stitch. They look like little tornadoes in there. And it was a pain in the butt um, because my thread wasn't long enough. It was, it, this was probably the third or fourth attempt at it. Um, but it's gorgeous. I love this binding so much. Um, and it's for sale. As you can see, there's still a price tag on it. Uh, another no glue book is called a Coptic Stitch. And uh, these are just a series of what is called kettle stitches on the side. And you can just, as you can see, just keep going and going and going. Um, a lot of artists like to make these really long Coptic books. Um, and they have this like very cool caterpillar movement to them. Um, this is a little mini one. And they definitely open flat. They're a much looser binding. Um, so if you like that kind of thing. Um, and they're always in the exposed, well not always, but they're exposed uh, spine. So you can see how fun that this one can be. Yeah, this more sculptural piece. So those are stab bound and Coptic stitch. But then sometimes <laughs> you just have to use all of the tools and all of the tricks and all of the materials. And these are um, sewn onto tape books. And they are uh, books that are a series of signatures. So they're multi-signature. Each signature is sewn to the next one until it gets to the end. There is a beginning and an end. And then kettle stitches on the top and the bottom for reinforcement. This one I left exposed and it's more of kind of a ribbon tape, but typically the tapes are not meant to be seen. Um, they are hidden away behind the spine cover. And you, uh, any book, that is hardcover like this is definitely going to be um, a sewn onto tapes, and you can you can check that out by um, let's see a little bit of the spine. You can see the individual signatures in there, but also um, in the center of each signature, you'll actually see the threading in there. But you know, a book like this isn't necessarily uh, sewn by hand. They were, um, but there's automation now for that. So this is what it looks like underneath. This is a um, Polish version of uh, Treasure Island um, that I found when I was in Poland. And I really liked the graphic on it. So I just cut out the inside and used the covers um, for There's another one, multicolored. So you could tell which was the top and the bottom. This is one with all black paper on the inside. For you folks who like to draw with white um, pencil or chalk. But then when you cover the spine, you have more parts to your book here. You have your spine cover, you have your hollow, which is generally at the top there. It's called a hollow. Sometimes you can put little headbands on there. 
This is from a sheet of uh, Sumi Nagashi paper. Um, this is ink floating on water and you transfer it to paper. It's Sumi ink. Um, it's the oldest form of marbling. And I make these pretty much with a fury now. Um, every craft fair that I do, which, you know, unfortunately wasn't the last year, um, I like to make these all the same size and have them all be these individual little pocket books. Uh, they are, there's something that is just less intimidating about a small sketchbook for me. Um, I never really liked being forced into carrying a sketchbook around when I was in art school. Um, so I would start getting these smaller and smaller books um, so that I wouldn't feel intimidated by having to fill the whole page. Uh, so um, now I make these magnet covers, uh, magnet hinged, um, covers on there. I put my marbled paper on the inside and sheets. This is cut from an 18 by 24 sheet. I put placeholders, placeholder ribbons on all of them. And I don't know how many sheets they are, but it's about, yeah, they're about an inch, inch thick. This is a kind of a non pareil uh, pattern. Well, this is a non pareil, this is kind of a bigger one. Um, I call this the wall. The magnets are inlaid into the book board uh, and covered by the book cloth. So they're kind of tucked away, hidden away in there. This one last one for you. And I do sell these. Let's see if I can get the light right. This is a gold, shimmery gold. So with the paper marbling, I um, I got into it, uh, oof, it was um, probably four years ago, I think now. Um, I was, oh yeah, it was four years ago because I was doing a one a day project um, and I ran out of papers to use for my end sheets, um, papers that I was okay using. So I, I really started buying these sheets of marble paper. I wasn't too thrilled with them. These patterns that were kind of more traditional and um, in colors that were not really, not really my palette. So, um, so I started teaching myself and I started with Sumi Nagashi um, and then eventually got into acrylic paper marbling um, and I've been doing that pretty regularly in my studio ever since. Um, I will be teaching it in October at Peters Valley. It's a crash course, two days um, in paper marbling. You can learn to make the traditional patterns like nonpareils and then go a little bananas and create your own uh, patterns. I've taught it there multiple times. It fills up like that. Um, so I know that there's already, I think, at least four or five people signed up. I think the max is eight. So get on Peter's Valley's website right after you're done here and uh, sign up. It's a hoot. So this last batch that I'm going to pull up here. Whoa. Is, oh my gosh. Okay. Whew. So these are more the sculptural side, um, sculptural style books. Um, this is when we talk about, you know, bringing other materials or altering the materials um, or having them be more of this interactive 
uh, experience. Let's take this out. This first one here, it's a big one. Um, it's called either a star book or a carousel. It's viewed in the round. I made these funky little uh, fans that move, um, these little kind of pop-up features uh, or kinetic features in there. So all the fans move, um, but the book itself then, I'll tie it here. Closes up and becomes a nice little package. So it's this really cool surprise when somebody's like, hey, you want to see this book? And you're like, yeah, sure, whatever. It's a book. And you're like, bam, it's a star. Star book carousel. It also is actually an accordion. Ta da! It's a multi layered, so it has. Um, it has three accordion books all layered together. It's a lot of swearing while you're measuring and cutting and folding. So just heads up on that. You're going to be swearing a lot when you make one of these. And this is actually another one of those drum leaf books where the back side and the front side of the pages are glued together. This one was done with stiff paper so that it would stay open and have this really cool opportunity to be its own sculpture. I have little peekaboos in here too of different different, uh, some Kitakata paper that's glued right into it just to give it a little bit more depth and dimension. Uh, I'll show this one too. Uh, first. Well, actually, no, I'll show this one. So this is a series of books um, that was part of a one a day project. So I made a book a day. Um, I'll show you some of those images here. Um, I made one book a day for the course of an entire month. Um, and it was uh, what got me through the inauguration month of, um, of Trump. And these were the days during the inauguration, January 19th, 20th, 21 and 22 and they it was a calendar um it was a countdown <laughs> clearly i got tired of of counting um and uh they're all perforated pages they kind of are dark stacks i made them small so it didn't seem like it would be as um terrible of, of four years um They'll kind of sit together like so, and then the torn pages onto the side there. Like probably the darkest piece I've ever made. Uh, then we have some a little bit slightly more non-traditional style books. Um, this one is um, it is called A Long Dress. That might be too bright here. But um, so this is a container, a box that was folded from paper, um, and it has a recontextualization of Gertrude Stein's poem, The Long Dress, or A Long Dress. So the whole thing looks like a continuous stitch. Um, but it's the entire poem in Morse code and how fragile it is. It comes with an eraser. It's all written, um, written out in, uh, in pencil in there. 
discusses the fleetingness, fleeting time. Kind of in the same vein is a book that I made, uh, an art, art book that I made in when I was at Penland, um, taking a class with Matthew Schlein, um, who is a paper engineer and sculptor. Um, so this piece is, um, I think it's called Contained. Um, so it's one continuous piece that begins very tiny and is folded, pleat folded. This is called a pleat fold on a sheet that gets larger and larger wider and wider as it hits the bottom. And I love this piece. I've shown it a few times and it's just, it's really fun to just kind of, you know, let it sort of hang out, trickle out. So this is kind of more of this, like this artist book that um, involves the reader more actively. So that's what I have to show here, um, but I would love to show you all um, some works on, that I have saved, ready to go on my screen. Um, I'm gonna show you that one a day project here first. Um, so, um, can you see this as my screen sharing? I hope yep, so. You're, yep, we can see it. Your screen sharing. It's a black book. Great. Red circle. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so the one a day project that I did, um, I documented, I sold each book. Well, I haven't sold all of them yet, but um, the books that I did sell, um, half of the proceeds went to Planned Parenthood. Uh, and I just you know, I was in a real slump. I wasn't really making much. And this really propelled me into um, creating again. And um, I just, I loved this project. I'm going to do it again some year. It's every January here. It's an accordion. And this was all done. I was working full time. So it's like, you know, at the end of the night, just, you know, burning the midnight oil. That one you saw, that's another post bound. It's another pleat fold. Pleat fold that you saw. This is a, I think a kind of simple binding pamphlet. This one I love, this is a, this is a tunnel book and it's in the possession of St. Ambrose University uh, in Iowa. Um, they have a book arts program there, or I think they had a book arts program there, um, but it is an accordion style fold on the side or pleat style fold on the side, um, and then different layers. It's kind of like that carousel book, um, but, uh, but I really love that you can have these peekaboos from the, the pages behind. Oops. Another pamphlet, stab bound with a different style of uh, binding there. It's another pamphlet, multi-signature. This is a pop-up book or a pop-up style, just a single, um, single cover back, uh, front and back. And then the paper is just glued right into the cover boards, the back side. pamphlet. This one is a simple bound uh, flip book that I, unfortunately, the movie did not come up on there. This is the one that I was just showing y'all. I can't believe I made this in a night. Another post bound that you saw this. I love this accordion book. I don't know who bought this, but 
And these were old uh, relief prints that I had made. So dry point, pamphlets, that one you've seen. And then the very last day, January 31st, um, I just took scraps from every book that I had made and made this stab bomb book there. Um, but enough about my work here. I'm gonna show, um, let's see, how do I go back to this? Let me go back to here. Um, I'm gonna start showing some other people's work here. Um, so if you are interested in pop-up books, um, there's a fellow named Sean Sheehy, who actually I believe he is taught at Piers Valley as well. Um, I got to meet him when I was in Iowa and um, he's from Chicago and he makes these really beautiful, fun pop-up books. Um, so you can look up his work. Um, Colette Fu, Fu is a Philadelphia paper engineer. Um, I got to see this giant book in, um, in, in person at the Philadelphia Photo Arts Center, which is uh, in the building that I manage. Um, she does some amazing pop-up books, so check her out. Um, I'm trying to show it to you. There's one of them. Um, she's a photographer as well. Sue Blackwell, she's pretty famous for her sculptural books. Julie Chen, uh, she's more interactive books. She has a uh, flying fish press uh, and she makes, you know, these books that are games that are interactive that have these really like kind of tactile um, quality to them. So um, I really love her books. These are amazing. Brian Detmer, when we're talking about altered books that become um, pretty much, uh, it no longer functions as a book that can be read. Um, you still have this kind of linear quality to it, this narrative. Um, this beginning and an end to it. Um, yeah. um, Keith Smith, I wanna talk about Keith Smith for just a second here because he is the master at um, technical how-to books. His books uh, on bookmaking, how to bookmake, um, is, uh, are very technical. You have to learn his language um, so studying his books are kind of key to being able to um, follow along, but you wouldn't know that he is such a loose and free and um, colorful, full of colorful uh, art. Um, he had a show at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, it was absolutely incredible. He never shows his work in big institutions. Um, so you can go on the Philadelphia Museum's um, website and find Keith Smith at home or type that in and see some images from that show. Um, it's more sculptural books, Jonathan Callan. And then there are book organizations out there. Uh, can't there. So 23 Sandy is a gallery that uh, that has multiple book artists in there and you can purchase art books as artist books as well. Philadelphia Center for the Book, uh, right here in Philadelphia. And they put on an annual uh, book fair and uh, that's always at the free library and it's free to attend. Uh, the Center for Book Arts, if there are any New Yorkers out there, um, go there, it's amazing. Um, Kalamazoo Book Arts Center, uh, a former professor of mine uh, started this up. It's in a building that I used to have a studio in in Kalamazoo, Michigan. And I'm gonna bore you with me just for a little bit longer. I have a website, uh, I have a couple websites. This is more my printmaking works. 
Um, whoops. Uh, that's some screen print, um, some more uh, sculptural and interactive pieces, um, some unconventional prints from pyrographs. Uh, yeah, so check that out. Um, and then my hustle for uh, my marbling is called Parhelion Works. And this is where I have all of my uh, marbled paper that you can see. Um, I also have links to my Instagram and Etsy page. Um, so if you like what you see, uh, then come on out to Peters Valley, October 2nd and 3rd and take my class. Um, yeah, I think, I think I'm done. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Great. <laughs> that was great. Um, so let's see, we've got some questions here. Um, and um, for all of you that are processing, feel free to add questions. Um, Julia Zimmerman is asking, what type of magnets do you use and where do you get them in your books? <laughs> Neodium magnets. And I get them from, I don't know, it's like magnet.com or something. It's those really strong magnets. Hold on, I'll grab one right now. Um, it's those super strong magnets that you shouldn't put like, like near credit cards or your phone or whatever, but it's these guys that will give you blood blisters if they snap against you. But they have so many different um, magnets. They have these little thin ones. So they're all stuck together here. Um, and you just have to be really careful. They're really strong and they snap back together and they shatter. <laughs> um, but they're about the thickness of half of the book board. So I can score into the book board and place one of these guys in and um, it sits nice and flat. So they're, uh, I think it's mag magnet, magnets.com or something. Um, I don't know, I'll send it along to Kristen if, uh, if that's helpful. Julia says, I could hear their strength. That's why I asked. Oh, I'm like being very careful so I don't shatter these. Yeah. So Andrea Lopinto is asking, are the complex folded papers traditional origami or where did you find these folds? Which ones? The, the complex folded papers in the books, are they traditional origami folds or did you find these folds elsewhere? Probably these guys. Mm -hmm. Um, no, I think I just maybe made this one up. I, I, they're not traditional origami. Um, they're plate folded books. I really do like origami. Uh, I don't have anything up right now because I just moved here. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, yeah, these are just plate folds. So they're just, um, you know how you make those paper fans. Um, it's almost just like that. So they're kind of folded on themselves over and over um, until you get what looks like pleats. Great. Now, Robin Abrams is commenting, much of the experience of book arts is tactile, but often when they're shown in galleries, the viewer is not allowed to touch them. Like a sculpture, see Xu Bing or Brian Dentmer. Do you see clear differences between an artist book and an artist sculpture using books? Um, well, yeah, I mean, of course, Brian Detmer doesn't want people touching his work. Um, it is more of a sculpture and, um, but a lot of books, well, and also it's for security reasons, of course, but um, in some galleries and uh, they're usually smaller and have guards around, um, they'll give you cotton gloves to wear, which I feel is actually more damaging to a page because they usually don't fit well. Um, so um, oils from your hands, I made sure to wash my hands really well before I came out here. Oils from your hands will transfer to papers, and that's why a lot of folks um, won't allow their books to be touched um, because that will put stains on it. Um, it'll break down the page after a while. You can't really monitor easily how, um, you know, what people have done with their hands before they touch your book. Um, yeah, hope that answers your question. That's great. Well, Jen M says, these are so beautiful. 
Yeah. Um, Sarah Gosley says, could you share all the links in the chat before ending so we can follow up? I believe that Rachel has been putting the, the links to um, the website and all of that. Um, but you, can, you can email Leslie afterwards. You can go to her website if there's something you have a question about. Um, Heather Tilton Benoit says, stunning and inspiring. Sashka says, amazing, Leslie, thank you. Hi, Sashka. Um, and then Heather Tilton is saying, inspiring, started junk journaling last year. Now, what is that? Hmm. Journaling. Junk journaling. Is that, is that kind of a, like collage, like decoupage or scrapbook style? Hmm. Heather, you're going to have to answer that because now I'm curious. I know. I love junk. I have lots of it. <laughs> Bill Chifuni says, thank you for showing your work and thank you, Peters Valley, for putting on this wonderful webinar. Well, thank you, Bill, for joining us. This is great. Thank you. Um, Heather says, and I've always loved the way books are put together. Uh, Bill says, when you create a book, do you make multiple copies or one-offs? Oh, that's a good question. And I have a great answer for it. So some people don't like me as a teacher because, so when you're a printmaker, um, there is this thing called a portfolio exchange because prints can be done in multiples. Um, so you can make multiple and other people make multiple and they collate together into what is called um, a, a portfolio exchange and you get one of everybody's print. Well, I've done that to my students with books. So <laughs> this is a collection of books from former students of mine. Um, and they loved getting a book from each one of their classmates at the end of the year. Um, but that meant that they had to make, well, how many people were in here? Blah, I, 17. They had to make 17 of the same book. But this was also like, a printmaking class as well. Um, so I taught them how to do like these Xerox transfers and said, all right, you know how to make Xerox transfers. Now put them in this style of book. And then at the end of the semester, they could do whatever they wanted for their edition. And a lot of people chose like, you know, the easier like pamphlet style books. Um, but then some folks, and this is that, that one that I showed y'all earlier, the the one that had the screen print on the inside. Then there were some people who, you know, just really went off the rails, man, and just really went full blown with it. Um, so yeah, like for instance, she made 17 of these guys. So yes, they can, there'll be multiples, but they'll, they'll have their, they'll have their little differences. So yeah, hopefully that answered your question. Um, and I have another one too, so I have more books. That's beautiful. So um, um, somebody wanted the links to the artist, but let's just get their name. So it's Colette Fu. Yep, Colette Fu, F-U, C-O-L-L-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. Um, Sue, S-U, Blackwell. Uh, Brian Detmer, if you just type in artist book, like he comes up, yeah. um, Sean, uh, with an S H and a W, um, she, he, that's S H E E H Y. Uh, who else? Julie Chen, that's C C H E N or flying fish press, um, 23, and that's the number two and the number three, Sandy, S-A-N-D-Y, is a really great organization or a really great gallery that has multiple artist books uh, or uh, book artists in there. So try there. That would be a good place to start too. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. I think I took them in and, and uh, so did Rachel. So that's good. Um, let me see if there's any other questions. One open question. What type of glue do you use? Oh, okay. I'll show you. It's like a baking show. Right? 
Well, uh, bring the whole kitten boodle out here. So there's my little blue setup here. And this is my like, you know, this is my uh, uh, little bottle. It's PBA glue, polyvinyl acetate glue. Um, Linaco is a great brand that has all sorts of book binding um, tools and supplies, materials. Um, the glue is the best thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, I'm not really a big fan of their thread, but it's um, very affordable. Um, I use a lot of, uh, I'm just going to kind of digress a little bit, but I use um, Baker's twine. I love like the different colors that you can get of Baker's twine. Um, and yeah, it makes, it makes the insides of your signatures like kind of fun to see. Um, but yeah, PVA glue is the best. So there's Baker's twine in there. Um, it's dual colored and you just wax it so it's even stronger. Yeah, that's great. So junk journaling is using papers and ephemera into book signatures. And uh, Sally says it's taking miscellaneous papers, envelopes, et cetera, and binding it into a book. Oh. So it sounds like a, a bit of what you were doing with the uh, scraps even making. Yeah. Oh, okay. I made a junk book. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's wonderful. Um, so it's also a nice way to use the prints or the marbling, like the scraps, or mm -hmm. gives purpose to a next step, which is. Oh, yeah. And yeah. I would always, I would say, always save your scraps, but then you're going to end up with a lot of scraps, like I have. <laughs> and two sets of flat files to hold all of them. There you go. Yeah. So Arlene Rubin says, what is your cheapest and most expensive book in dollars? <laughs> A dollar and uh, 600 probably. <laughs> That's great. You have a range. <laughs> yeah. um, so Julia Zimmerman is saying, what types of cookies come with your book with the baker's twine? <laughs> uh, vegan gluten-free chocolate chip. That's my jam. Oh, yum. That sounds good. <laughs> I've perfected that one. Yeah, that sounds really good. Um, okay, I think, does anyone have any other questions? I think we're just about wrapped up. Um, I want to thank everyone. Oh, one more question. What are your favorite papers from Liz Horton? My favorite papers for insides of books, for the content, like the text block. Um, I mean, I really like as an art paper, BFK is like the way to go. Um, a 250 GSM, um, 230 GSM is my favorite for printmaking. It's great for wet medium. Um, as far as like decorative papers, my own. Um, but uh, let's see, I really like Kitakata paper and that's K-I or Kitakata, I think is actually how it's pronounced. It's K-I-T-A-K-A-T-A. -A -A. Um, it's, a, it's a Japanese paper and it's really durable. It's great for printmaking. Um, you can soak it forever. Um, it's great for intaglio. Um, and it has this like really kind of dreamy translucency to it. Um, it's usually like a kind of a beigey color with lots of fibers. Um, yeah, it doesn't have a grain, so it's very difficult to uh, tear. So you, it's, it's not a really nice, terrible paper um tear able paper um yeah those are a couple faves that's great thank you um so wow. i think we're just about wound up so thank you so much leslie if um remember you can go to leslie's website and check her 
workout and see what else is going on. Um, and she'll be here in October. And she's a fabulous teacher, having taken your mono printing class. It was so much fun. And thank you all for tuning in. And um, we look forward to seeing you back in the fall, and in the upcoming fall when we start the season up again. And um, if not, we hope to see you on campus. So oh, one more question. Um, no, no comments. You're getting, Arlene says your work is beautiful. Thank you. And Julia says awesome. Thank you, quite enlightened. And I think, yes, we all learned so much. Who knew? Thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. You guys have, uh, you guys have been really quiet out there, but I, I can't hear you or see you. I'm just talking to myself as far as I do, but um, I thank you so much for attending. It really means a lot to me and um, hopefully I'll hear from, from y'all and um, I, I love answering questions. Um, I, yeah, yeah, reach out. And you can go visit the Crane Arts Building, right? Because there, there's the gallery. Uh, no, I, I, um... We're talking about reopenings right now. So um, Crane Arts is a building of uh, 65 units, um, a floor of gallery spaces on the first floor. Um, I'm the building mom there. Um, we haven't quite opened up back for reception nights yet. We're talking about that right now for possibly July. Um, we do second Thursdays instead of first Fridays. Um, but uh, there are some great galleries and they really want to get back into having, um, having the public in. So we're working through all of that right now. That's great. So if anyone wants to rewatch this, it'll be on our YouTube channel, the Peters Valley uh, YouTube channel in a couple of days. So thank you so much. Thank you. Um, you've got lots of nice compliments. Victoria Cable says beautiful books, Carolyn. Gutz Jar says, thank you, wonderful work and a fun, informative presentation. And Kate says, can't wait to see it on YouTube. And um, lots of thank yous. So thank you very much. Thank you. It was really wonderful to be with you tonight. And it was great to see you and Rachel too. Thank you, Rachel, for manning the ship. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Leslie. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. We would like to thank our sponsors for making programs like this possible. If you liked this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel to receive more like it in the future.